thank you, Graham, and uh, thanks to everyone who um, uh, found it uh, interesting enough for the afternoon session to uh, come back after lunch. Uh, this discussion uh, tries to focus um, around uh, the difficult issue of perioperative management in a um, cohort of patients who can have um, significantly uh, difficult issues in and around this time. Uh, we will uh, discuss a little bit about the pathophysiology of cancer pain and some of the demographics. Uh, but really what I wanted to do is um, try and present some case examples to um, illustrate some of the difficulties that we can come across in this environment. Um, the, I have a couple of declarations to make. I have to write them down on a piece of paper because there's three of them. Um, I have received honorarium for GP education from both Pfizer and Mundi Pharma, and I have rec received travel sponsorship um, for continued medical education from St. Jude, Jude Medical. Uh, so wh why is this important? Well, um, uh, earlier on last century, uh, your chances of dying of cancer were actually fairly low. Um, however, as we've progressed through time, and you'll see in the um, graph, which is the mortality uh, by cause and year, as we've progressed along through the um, latter half of the 20th century, cancer rates have increased compared to other uh, diseases, and uh, circulatory diseases um, have dropped off. Uh, this uh, report came out in 2008, um, the World Cancer Report, uh, and as reported by the Washington Post, by 2010, i.e. now, uh, you are more likely to, um, or I am more likely to die a long lingering death from cancer than I am to drop dead of um, cardiovascular disease. And what this means is that there will be um, uh, 17 million cancer deaths annually by 2030, um, and 75 million people um, are living with cancer five years after diagnosis by this time. So, when we break this down, currently we've got 9 million patients worldwide with cancer pain, uh, which leads to a point prevalence globally of about 0.2%. And if we assume that that's the same in Australia, we've got about 44,000 people in Australia with some form of cancer pain. Uh, cancer pain is the, uh, sorry, pain is the first uh, um, symptom presenting in uh, almost half of um, cancer cases. And when you're looking at the advanced cancer population, the rates of pain are much, much higher. Uh, arguably of greater significance um, uh, for the general clinician is that 30% of patients who are deemed cancer survivors will have persisting pain of one form or another. When we look at subgroups of cancer, um, although the um, uh, information here describes quite a range of uh, incidents of pain, and this depends on how we actually investigate what that is, we'll see that we're looking at um, above 50% for most forms of cancer. And the sort of pain that we get in cancer, um, variable, but there are some uh, aspects to it that are uh, quite common uh, across patients. There tends to be this background pain, and then we see some spikes of pain throughout the course of a day that may relate to the end of, um, of the patient's medication, they may relate to movement and other activities, uh, or they may be spontaneous and of a neuropathic feature. Bony pain is um, a, a type of pain that's quite particular to cancer. Um, and also, in addition to the uh, typical psychological aspects of any form of chronic pain, there's also the added issue of existential distress, which is the fact that you know that you're probably likely to die soon and can't do much about it. Uh, what about the pathophysiology? Well, yes, um, you do get direct invasion and growth of uh, tumour in solid organs and other structures, causing compression. You get neural compression and irritation. But also, the cancer sets up an inflammatory response in the body, both locally and systemically, and the consequence of that response is sensitisation of nerve structures, including uh, pain fibres. Uh, and as such, we are more prone to developing uh, uh, pain states with cancer. There's also pain related to the cancer treatments. Um, obviously, the most relevant to uh, this audience will be uh, pain related to the acute surgical treatment of cancer. Um, but there's also pain related to cancer procedures, such as bone marrow aspirations, um, chemotherapy can induce painful neuropathies, and radiation can cause pain, especially uh, long term when it uh, is aimed towards neural structures. When we look at surgery for cancer, again, we see fairly high rates of persisting pain, so in that sort of 30 to 50 percent mark. Uh, the, probably the take home message from these percentages is that there's around about 10 percent of people who have cancer for any form, so it's surgery for any form of cancer, who will have persisting pain that has a significant impact on their function or their psychology. 
I'm going to throw in four sample cases during the talk. Um, these are uh, fairly typical patients that we would deal with at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. The first is a 42-year-old um, woman who's had local recurrence of erectile cancer. She's had a primary surgery, and after her primary surgery, she had some persisting pain. That was managed by her oncologist and by her um, surgeon and by her uh, local medical officer, and she ended up on a, a fairly hefty amount of oxycodone. Um, I had a nice picture of a pelvic exenteration, uh, which is obviously removal of the vast majority of the pelvic organs, um, where the first, the primary surgeon is looking down through the abdominal wound, the secondary surgeon is looking up through the perineal wound, and they're shaking hands between them. However, when I showed that picture to my kids, it gave them nightmares for a week, and so I thought I'd save you from the uh, trauma. Um, so look, for this sort of example, uh, we, we adopt very much that multimodal approach that was talked about in previous lectures, and a lot of this is really aimed at trying to limit and avoid, um, what, try, trying to treat what is already a wound up pain system, uh, developed opioid tolerance, but also the high likelihood of developing ongoing and worsening of this persistent pain. So we'll typically give some sort of preoperative gabapentinoid, uh, and I'm fortunate in the hospital that I work in where they throw money at the um, drug budget like nobody's business, and so I can give these patients pregabalin without anyone batting an eyelid. Um, we'll use neurexal analgesia almost universally in these patients unless they refuse to have it. Um, we'll typically use intraoperative ketamine in spite of the lack of long-term evidence. We'll use it because it's a good medication for opioid tolerance. Um, these patients will be managed in our hospital in an HDU environment because I think it's extremely difficult to institute some sort of acute management plan for these patients and expect them to cope on a ward unless there's a significant amount of infrastructure put in place. Um, and we'll use our PCA often in addition um, to our um, opioid via epidural, which is not standard management. So um, we've talked about some of the other ways in which our treatments can lead to um, ongoing pain. Um, there are um, uh, cancer drugs that we use fairly commonly, um, especially for uh, myelomas. Uh, these drugs can cause peripheral pain. Um, the, um, there are some alternatives, and this one here is an advert for a um, uh, myeloma um, chemotherapeutic agent that is less likely to cause painful peripheral neuropathies. Um, the, the, the platinins, the taxanes, and the vinca alkaloids are the main culprits here. Uh, Parasthesias, dysesthesias are very common, but as far as long-term painful pain problems go, uh, less so. Bony pain deserves a special mention uh, because bony malignancies uh, are thought to be one of the most severe forms of uh, long-standing cancer pain. Uh, the ones that are most common are breast, prostate, lung, and renal, uh, left off the chart there, and also primary bony malignancies, multiple myeloma. The, pathological, the pathophysiological process of the pain, obviously through expansion and destruction, but also through that chemical sensitization, and there's emerging evidence to suggest that there's a, a neuropathic element as well because of the neural innervation of the bone and the periosteum. Uh, also, with the incident pain, we need to be very uh, mindful of the fact this may represent fracturing uh, um, pathological fracturing in bones. 